series on creating a website from scratch with Python, Django, and the Wagtail CMS. This series is back on track with the Code Buddies community. Code Buddies is a global community of amazing people who help each other become better at software development through conversations on Slack and peer-to-peer -peer organized study groups and virtual hangouts. Today's session is part of a Code Buddies hangout where we'll we're building a magazine subscription website with Python and Django. It's live now, but if you're already here in Twitch, then you're already part of the Hangout. The project we're working on is open source on GitHub. You can follow the link uh, that's overlaid on the video, github.com slash westernfriend, to access all the latest code at any point in time, and to look at the commit history to see the changes that were made around the time of this recording and perhaps make your own project based on uh, the ideas you see here. Today we're going to be continuing with the magazine subscription feature. Just a really quick glimpse on the Western Friend website. There's a magazine section. We're reproducing this website that we've built over the last, uh, I think, six years with Drupal. Drupal's given us a lot of uh, power to do things by a drag and drop and all through an administrative user interface, we're just realizing that increasingly we're gonna to need to turn to the code to have more clarity and control over how things work. And my recent background is with Python, uh, I'm not so eager to go to delve into uh, PHP. I'm already uh, kind of struggling to keep up with Python and JavaScript, which are the main languages that I'm using in JavaScript, of course, is the main uh, imperative language for web development. So back on topic, the magazine um, page displays the recent issues, the three most recent issues of which have um, content for subscribers only primarily. There's a little bit of a article teaser a non-subscriber can see. If I view one of the articles as featured, I can read the whole thing, but if I view an article that's not, it's asking us to subscribe. Western Friend is a nonprofit organization, but they do get a little bit of revenue from subscriptions. So their model is that the most recent three issues, which is six months, it's published every other month, uh, are um, uh, subscribers get preferential access to those. And the archives, everything going back to 1920, I keep having to look this up, 1929, 1929, fully available online, free for the world. I think that's a pretty reasonable business model, particularly since they're a nonprofit organization. There's a lot of great content in Western Friends. So we're gonna continue porting this website over to Python and Django and Wagtail CMS. But first, let me get some tea. Today I've got a mix of two chai teas. Puka Vanilla Chai and English Tea Shop Turmeric Ginger and Lemongrass. Oh, I grabbed the wrong box. So it's a not two chais, it's a chai and a turmeric, ginger, and lemongrass. This is gonna be an interesting combination. Not too bad though. Okay, excellent. So let me see, there's some changes here. What do we have? Just opening up this project. Okay, what we did here is we actually added a PayPal button. When I was getting review from Mary, she wanted to see how the PayPal would work. Now, I could actually, let me think here for just a second. I could wire up this PayPal button. Last session, we made a unified use of this pr um, payment processing form. So people can arrive at this payment processing form from the bookstore and the magazine subscription. It's sharing the same code. And this JavaScript that's embedded in the payment processing template um, can take variables from 
in the Django. This is this is rendered on the server side. So JavaScript community has gone full circle and they're back on server side rendering now. And Django's always stayed on server side rendering. Uh, and I think so anyway, I'm glad to be here. I think there's actually some interesting developments with these uh, traditionally server side rendering frameworks like Django and Laravel and um, there's one more, I can't think of the name of it, where they're actually able to dynamically generate JavaScript and stream page updates, content updates, sort of uh, analogous to Ajax, to the client, but it's like pushing the data out or responding to client changes without having to write those Ajax calls. Uh, I'm looking forward to checking that out, but that's not really going to be relevant to this project. So let's see. If we continue down this PayPal path, the, um, we'll have to pass in the amount from the bookstore shopping cards or the subscription form. That shouldn't be too hard. The other thing I want to work on uh, soon, and I was actually planning on working today, is how to look up um, a sub subscription, basically. If an, a user is browsing the site and they're logged in, how to see if they have an active subscription. Um, so I had really thought about that more. Let me just take a quick uh, look if there's a way to pass this in. So from, I think there is actually. So let's start from the bookstore. When we're at the bookstore, we're actually at, so from, how do we get to the payment screen from the bookstore? I think we're at the order page. So we have the order module. And when I submit this order form, no, no, no. There's a view. We're going to create an order. And here we redirect to the payment process form. I believe what I can do is get the order total, the calculated total here, and pass it in here. If I just check out the Django documentation, we can probably figure that out pretty quick. So let's go over there. I think it's going to be somehow passing the context into the redirect. Oh, look at that. So it's got args, but not quargs. Oh, it does have quargs. So let's use this two equals payment URL. Let's make this a little bit more verbose but explicit. Redirect to the payment view. Now I guess you can just Passing quarks, permanent redirect is for managing sites. Redirects. Let's see if I can just pass in, oh, let's say PayPal total. Or, well, yeah, let's just start there with 10. Let's do like 30 euros, so it's a little bit different. We'll save that. Now we'll open up our payment process. I'm going to actually open the file. And now I believe I can actually just firstly just display PayPal total here. Just to see if it was in our, our data context. And if not, then I'll have to go and figure it out a little bit. Uh, so let's see, I'm not running the sites, so pip env. And the server. There we go, and we'll just localhost connect. Uh, 
the thing I have to do really quick is set up the bookstore. I haven't uh, set up this dummy content right just yet. So let's add a child page. Maybe I'm mistaken here. Oh, I do have the bookstore. All right, cool. <laughs> now we go to the checkout, fill in the details for an order. Recipient and PayPal total is not passed in. Okay, so I'll just have to. Quarks, that makes it is not uh, a, literally a context. So let me just check. Uh, <laughs> it was a guess. Sometimes you know you can guess things with, with um, particularly as consistent as uh, Django has been, but that also shows my level of familiarity. So Django. Website shoots themselves in the foot when I do that. Mm. So I just have to catch the quarks, it looks like. stuff going back to 2015 2016 it's rendering it hmm so they're saying passing as URL This doesn't turn out to be super straightforward. I will just continue with the original plan. But Check, maybe it is passing it as URL arguments. Not up here. So our redirect code. I think I know, I actually need to just check the context for the payment view and going about this wrong. So actually at the um, view here for payment processing, I have the entity in question. I can just pass that into the template context. Here we go. So let me just go to the view. So when somebody hits this payment processing page, there comes in a request and I get the related entity here. So either an order or a subscription. So I don't actually need to forward that information. I just need to render it into the uh, into the template. This is the proper way to do it. So you're rendering the request data to a template and adding some context. Yeah. Right, let's try this out. So I don't be so PayPal specific uh, order total would be good. 
Uh, or what is it called? Payment total, maybe. We have entity dot get total cost. <clears throat> now in our template, I can say payment total. So this is JavaScript with HTML with the Django. I guess this does have to be a string with Django templating syntax embedded because we're rendering this JavaScript on the server side. All right, let's try it out now. So yes, Real Python though is also a very good resource. Uh, I didn't quite have to use it here. I realized I was doing it wrong. But anyway, let's go back to the cart and uh, let's just add, let's take 10 of these. So we have a big order, 170 euro, dollars, 170 dollars. And name. Okay, now we're gonna create the order, pay. So what we have done previously is just paid with card, but we wanted to check out the uh, PayPal approach and it's opening on a separate page. I don't want to see that the total is the same. Yeah, man, it wants me to log in and everything. This is a sandbox account. Okay, one moment. I'm just gonna try it out over on my other screen. Well, apparently I can pay uh, on the PayPal sandbox. I don't have an account, which makes sense. And I it still allows me to pay with a debit or credit card. So let me just share this screen really quick. PayPal guest checkout. Good grief. It just doesn't show the total, the payment total. I wanted to make sure it was 170. Well, the other way to do it, this is janky, but thank you PayPal for not just letting, showing the total at the checkout process. Uh, so we'll just console log it and refresh the page. There it is, 150. All right, that's gonna work. Um, and this was a string before, so okay. Not super impressed. We're using Braintree though. Overall, I have been impressed with the Braintree uh, experience of writing only a few lines of code to get a multi-payment uh, checkout flow. And kind of glad that the web is sort of getting away from PayPal, although here we're clearly adding it back in for those users who do prefer PayPal. And I'm, I like the embedded approach, like Stripe and Braintree do. You just uh, send the information securely to the payment processor. But it's a little bit new, and not everybody's familiar with that, so we add this disclaimer up top. All right, so take out, we can have the code a little bit. Take out this, and this is order total. Now I know it works. working here as well, just Django templating. Hey, what's up, Quantum? Quantum says they really like Stripe because they allow band contact. Huh, never heard of that. What's band contact? Actually, this might not be bad to have.
Let's see what this looks like. Right above the pay button. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty clean. It's explicit what you're paying. Let's leave that in there. Quantum says, so you can pay by scanning a QR code. Oh, that's pretty crazy. It uses SEPA Direct Debit, I think. Okay, these are all just from, uh, foreign terms to me. I have no idea. Is that an American banking thing, or is that European or worldwide? Sounds cool, though. Paying with a QR code. It's an, it's an EU thing. SEPA is an EU thing. Okay, sounds like it. So, in other words, the payment amount is embedded in the QR code, and then you scan it and have, like, a... You have to download an app, or you have to have the Stripe app. And who's scanning the QR code? The payee, like the or the person that's paying. This is quite interesting. Stripe band contact. Let's look this up. Band contact. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, it's hard to find. Most mobile banking apps in Europe support it. That's cool. I do appreciate, oh, band contact, of course, I suppose. I do appreciate how easy it is to pay things in general in Europe. Like transferring funds. No, it's like bank contact, get it, bank. Hmm. Yeah, I've never heard of this. They do have some details in, f gosh. Sounds cool. All right, well, we, <laughs> we ended up going anyways with Braintree, uh, but I will keep that on my radar. Maybe it's only Belgium. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me, though, if it somehow became EU-wide. Yeah, SEP is EU-wide. Yeah, I'm familiar with IBAN. I don't know. Like, I can give somebody my IBAN number, and they can just send me money in the other way around. Like, So I pay people with IBAN, you know, sporting clubs or friends, family. It's pretty easy. All right, so we got a, a quick... Victory here. Let's refresh just to say it's got the dollar sign in there because that's the currency we're dealing in. IBAN is just the card number, but SEPA allows encoding all the transaction details in a QR code. That's what is, that sounds too cool. SEPA Maxu. <laughs> I wish it wouldn't like localize things for me. Single euro payment area. Oh, take that, UK. They're screwing themselves. Oh, man. Anyway, sorry. Pan-European payment instruments for credit transfers. Huh, it's been around for a while. Maybe look for SEPA QR code. SEPA banking. Yeah, they might even have something on the QR code here. QR. No. Yeah, direct debits. I also like that um, debit is so cheap. Like, there's a, I don't know what it exactly it is, but the EU law, there's a cap on the amount of in, uh, like fees that credit companies can charge people for transaction. <clears throat> I would like to see something like that in the United States. Cool beans. Hey, what's up, Dr. Unafraid? How are you doing today? 
All right, uh, we are now going to work on part B, which is back to the subscription. So, hmm, let me see. I've got this subscribe page, so maybe I should add that as a menu item. Overt thine eyes, I'm gonna create a static link in my navigation menu until I work out the menu feature for the website. I'm hard coding everything. I believe I'm gonna figure out a way of having a drag and drop menu that allows the uh, content editor to specify pages or arbitrary URLs and then change the order in which they appear at this navigation menu. But that is just an idea. It, it shouldn't be too hard though. Dr. Unrepreted says, good, how are you? Just uh, practicing algorithms in Python. Any tips for Python RESTful API in Django? Well, if you haven't encountered it already, that Django REST framework, um, it's got a bit of a learning curve, but at the end of the day, you'll be heading that way anyway. Oh, you're working with Odo? Odo? Udo? I don't know how to pronounce it. Odo. You work at Odo Quantum? No way. I've been checking that project out for a while. Are you serious? You work there? Wow, that's really awesome. <laughs> that's an amazing project. The I really like the drag and drop website builder. It's pretty crazy. Among other things, it's like uh, pretty epic. Dr. Unafraid said, I, I went for the interview, but got rejected. Oh, bummer, dude. We can always try again. You're working on the website builder? Oh man, you rock, Quantum. That is, is that, yeah, I mean, let's, double, let's check this out. This is, I, I haven't seen anything like this in, um, I've seen attempts, but nothing comes close to this in the open source uh, web development world. I know they have uh, drag and drop website builders. Um, could probably name several of them if I had the wherewithal, but I don't right now. But this is cool. I'm hoping actually Wagtail would get something like this. Check it out. Uh, is this wanting to send me notifications? Hmm. How do I make this bigger? In any case, you got, it's kind of like blocks. And you drag them out here onto a grid. How is this structured underneath here? Is it just an arbitrary grid or rows? The website builder is a big focus for the next version. Yeah, seriously, this is cool. This could just spin off as its own project. I think it would benefit like so many people. I gotta admit though, it's all bootstrap. Okay, well that's cool. One, <laughs> I'll just say this. Uh, I like that Odo's doing open source and finding business model around it. I just, I'm a little bit concerned about the pricing. That's, the, that's really the only thing that's kind of kept me from adopting it. I, I pay for open source, don't get me wrong. I, I believe that open source needs money, but somehow this just adds up so quick when you have like a few users, that a handful of users, like 10 users in a company or something like that. And I just want a couple of things. It just, boom, it explodes. So, bam, right there, just for 10 people. The enterprise is not open source. Yeah, that, I think, though, aren't these just mostly the open source modules? And, you know, I also think the, it's important to, I think there's a lot of value in having a managed service. So this is a, this is a great model, and I'm particularly like the a la carte. I just think these price points are just really high for um, compared to things like maybe Zendesk or something. Or some, in any case, so are these apps the community edition apps, or are these all enterprise edition apps? And if I is there a way of getting a managed Odo? How do you say it? By the way, I don't want to. Depends on the size of the business. They're, these are all enterprise. Okay, cool. So maybe that's it. Maybe it's just misconception. I'm not really harsh on Odoo because it's pretty awesome. And Dr. Unafraid says, how can I learn Odoo framework fast? Odoo. Yeah, there we go. The doc is crap, to be honest. Hmm. 
Compare editions, okay. Oof, that's also unfortunate. <laughs> cool though. Oh, it's got VoIP integration, e-signature. So where's this drag and drop site builder? Human resource inventory manufacturing, website builder. In a way, these um, hmm, call to action blocks are premium. Isn't this just a bootstrap card with a button? Interesting. That would be premium. Form builder, that's cool. Wagtail comes with a form builder too. <laughs> hmm, I'm sensing uh, a wagtail drag and drop site builder. If you just want to play with the website builder, you can log into a Runbot. Okay, is that is that this try it free? Onboarding took about a month. Here's a, and a he's got a link to a Runbot. That is too cool, Quantum. That you're working on this. <laughs> okay. Woo. Goodness. Okay. See so these branches. Mm, do I look at? Okay. <laughs> yeah, the trial feature too. Which uh, branch? All right. Do I just register? Or is there like a admin admin? <laughs> no need. Well, okay, here we go. Now. Okay, somewhat intuitive. Ooh, nice graphs. What is this? Uh, Charting library is Chart.js. Yep. Very cool. Very cool. Go to website. Then edit in the top right. Okay. Behold. Drag and drop. We need a cover. And we need a picture. Punchy headline, this is cool. Image gallery. And can you feed content into this from a CMS type thing? Or is this mainly for static sort of pages, like brochure pages and stuff? So can you kind of drag and drop a template that then renders, you know, kind of like what we're doing with this Django stuff where we're essentially just defining Templates in uh, HTML with some Django markup. This is cool, though. Okay, let's let's do some editing real quick. Let me just hide my code and maximize this. Can you see that? No, it won't work, will it? On the stream. Okay, never mind. Somehow my browser window gets gets messed up. It's like buried on on. Uh, OBS, I'm not sure how to fix that. I might just have to sh uh, share my my right monitor. Okay, so then you can just literally type. Found a bug. Look, it got the cursor there. Huh, now it's working. If you drop a snippet that doesn't have a parallax background, Dr. Unafraid says, is it the same like WordPress? I don't think it's a, it doesn't seem like a content management system. It's more like a site builder. So it's more like Wix, for example. It's a drag and drop site builder. WordPress is a content management system with some limited attempts at. Drag and drop site building. They're improving, but a lot of those are, are uh, 
commercial spinoffs. The WordPress ecosystem is sort of in a sad state. I'm not the only one that thinks this. With the, uh, in any case, I don't want to go too far off on that. But uh, cool. Now we've just created a business brochure website. I can save it. And there we go. Look at this professional design with a punchy headline. It's got parallax scrolling. Ooh, localization. Dude, this is cool. Hmm. My goodness. So then what do you do? Does it use Google Translate or something? You can move the background position. I wrote that. You wrote the parallax. Let's check that out. All right. So, oops, I see what happened. I sort of the website builder is is localized or something. I don't know what just happened. On on non-parallax snippets. So, like this super cool. Is that a non-parallax parallax snippet? Sort of works on parallax. One moment, just get a little bit of tea. This is too interesting to not have tea at hand. Okay, so, oh, latest post. So it does have a blog content type thing. Click on the snippet, then background equals position in the left menu. All right, so click on the snippet. Background equals. Okay. It's the little four arrows. So this one. Ooh. All right. So then if I, I want that. Oh shoot. What I do. So yeah, click and drag the background to adjust its position. So that way you get the right crop. You get the right po portion of the, in, uh, the interesting portion of the image showing. So if I, if I want to emphasize the teapot and the notebook, and I scroll. We don't support addition on small screens, unfortunately. But your screen is too small, so you can't validate it. Oh, I see. Yeah, I'm splitting splitting my uh, my 4K monitor. I don't know. It should like half of a 4K monitor is too small. Dang. This is bigger than a tablet. <laughs> All right, cool. In any case, good work. This is really awesome. Yeah, we have a small business, and we actually just went with WordPress recently, but uh, I was checking out Odo. Odo. Damn it. What are you? you just tell me how to say it. One second. It's way up there. Odoo. Oh, yeah, that's it right. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I was checking out Odoo oh, in the meantime. And a company I used to work for a couple years ago was working, uh, using it for the, the couple of things, ERP and time tracking. It's just got such a great scope of features. Pretty cool. All right. We're learning some interesting stuff today. Let's go ahead. So props to Odoo. If you're in the need of an ERP, CRM, help desk, website builder, uh, you name it, it's all in one package. It's Python based. Needs better onboarding is what uh, Quantum says. Yeah, that makes sense. Docs make a big difference. Is there sort of an internal onboarding process like a welcome wizard? I don't know how useful those are to be honest, but just wondering what the plans are for onboarding, helping people. Uh, where am I going? I'm looking for the navigation menu. So that was under like the main website. Templates, nav bar. I added just a copy and paste link. To 
do subscribe. Quantum says, yes, the internal onboarding is basically, here's how to write a module. Go and do it. Okay, so that's developer onboarding. Are the so the modules are written in Python? Okay, cool. Yeah, I think there was actually a Hacker News discussion about. Uh, so there we are. Subscribers link working to be expected about Odoo, and I can't even remember what the context was. But like the CEO joined in and had a good uh, some good feedback and posted to a couple of other links uh, where they mentioned the open source project that they that Odoo had, had forked out of, which honestly has not, doesn't have the polish that Odoo does, uh, but has good intentions. Okay, so we got a subscribe um, page. Let me just make sure that the data are being handled in from this form to the payment. Ooh. Oh man, that's not correct. The back end is all Python. Templates are a custom thing called Queb. And front end is JavaScript. Dr. Unafraid says, what's today's focus in Django and Python? Dr. Unafraid, today we are working on the subscription feature. And I just realized why my bug exists here. I have to. Um, what we're trying to do is check for when I'm I log in as a user, see if I've got an active subscription and display uh, some content accordingly. Now I realized what I had here. I don't know exactly how to fix it, but the problem is that let's hop over to the payment screen, the, the view. I sort of knew this was going to happen in the payment rendering process. Since I'm sharing code, I have to check if the payment is rendering an order or a subscription. And these are coming from session variables. And these session variables only ever get cleared out if the result is a success from the payment. Ouch. I think that was the idea was so that the customer could re-attempt the order, and that way I wouldn't have a copy and paste a bunch of code. But now I've left myself in a conundrum. So is QWeb similar to uh, what is it called? What's that Python templating language? Why didn't they? Why didn't they reuse one? Jinja, Jinja. It's very unique. So it's kind of like sounding like uh, <laughs> oh, Zope or something. <laughs> Where they just have done everything very uniquely. What is that? Plone. Hmm. I tried Plone a couple of times. I just couldn't make it happen. And it's pretty beefy. The most thing about most important thing about oh do templates is inheritance. Ah, nice. Kind of like uh Django has this template inheritance as well. All right, so let me unscramble my brain here though. I need to figure out this payment process. So if somebody abandons a payment their session's not going to be cleared out. Oh, man. And if the payment gets canceled, I don't necessarily want to clear out the session. I think the better way, I wonder if I can... Pass something in the request that says where I came from, and then I'll I won't have to rely on 
on these session variables, if I say request previous page or whatever equals subscription, let's try that actually. So your module can add new features into one of the base modules views and add functionality without duplicating code is the importance of Odoo template inheritance. It's done using XML and XPath, basically CSS selectors to say, I want to add a button after this original button. Oh, that's cool. Is that sort of like a dependency injection approach or something like along those lines? All right, so let's, let's go ahead and try this. Uh, back to, in this case, we're coming from um, 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 the subscription uh, view. Oh, goodness. Ah, but in this case, this is a trick I learned last week. I mod I, instead of defining a, a Django view, I learned that you can actually, in your wagtail model, your wagtail page model, override the serve method, which basically is a view. So, and here you have the full request, return super serve request. Here we go. I could use it as a, uh, let's just do it in previous. I don't know if I can add something directly onto the request. Let's first try that. Previous page equals. Subscribe. I hope this is still somewhat explicit and not too janky. I'm sort of inventing my own path here. It's like a combination of wagtail and stumbling through it. So Dagnabbit. So Quantum says it's called monkey patching. The whole template inheritance injecting things to the XML parsing. It's not DOM, it's XPath parsing. In dependency injection, the base code has to have an injection point where you can replace the dependency before running the code. So is this then overriding the serve module uh, method, member method of the Page instance, is this kind of like a dependency injection then? Where I'm, or is that I'm way off the, am I way off the uh, mark there? In monkey patching, you just say, take the base content and modify it like this. And Dr. Underfraid says, CTMR, sir. Quantum says, most operators are add only, which allows multiple modules to add functionality to the same Oh, to the same view without knowledge of each other. Aha, I'm pretty far off. So, okay, as it could be expected. Let me just have to modify the request in flight. I wonder if it has the some metadata I can use here. Hmm. Uh, 
I could put it in the session, but I'm back in the same boat where I... Huh. This just feels kludgy to me. What do you think about quantum, how I can add uh, some data on the request in flight? Essentially, as it's being prepared, this view in forwarding to the next episode. Yeah, just as metadata on the request object. Well, the thing is, hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just having a brain fart. But uh, basically, I just need to tell this payment process view. I think I just captured the corpse here. Where it came from, how the person got there. Let's see if this works. <laughs> So if I had a quark here equals, and we are at subscribe. So maybe a, you could always define property, but that's very hacky. Yeah, I don't do too hacky. I'm already pretty close to being hacky here. But if I just can pass in a you know, keyword argument to and, and access that in the subsequent view, this payment process view, I'm good to go. I believe my code will be relatively clean. I could even say from. Oh, but wait. Wait a minute, that's reserved. Okay. Now we're good to go. Let's see if this works. Oh my goodness. Does not support item assignment. Am I still assigning the thing in the bobber? Yeah, there's something, the request you can just, I can add it to the headers, that's a good idea. Oh, I see here, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna try this, whoops. The header sounds like a good one. Usually you use the refer header, that sounds like a, a legitimate way of doing it. This was though, what I was gathering is that it's from external sites. Let me just see if this approach works. Oh, where did we go? 
All right, so I'm coming from there, and oh my goodness. So the quarks didn't quite work. Hmm. All right. Well, do you think is there? Do you work with Django much? Is there just a Django way to go from one view, redirecting to another, and passing in some metadata? Mm. That's not part of the sort of URL. I don't want it to be in the query string. Hoping to be a dictionary. Why do I want to pass this metadata? Well, I'm probably I'm flailing, and I'm pro I'm not <laughs> I'm not thinking this through. Uh, no, I don't want to redirect it after. Okay, so here's the problem. I've got session variables. I'm using session variables. Oh, let me step back one more. So I've got two parts of the site where people make payments: a bookstore which you create orders in a subscription page. And both of those at the point of checkout, so to speak, land here on this payment process page. And it's a single view that handles both. And so what I'm doing here naively is just first checking if there's a, an order ID and then handling it if there's one existing. And the order and subscription entities have the same API. The problem is I only clear my session variables every so often and what I just encountered, the bug I just encountered is that if somebody had a bookstore order and failed to check out, their session variable is still hanging around. And if they go then to subscribe and fill in the details, there's a collision. It, 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 it's not a collision, but it, it, it still defaults to the order. So I was just thinking how to approach this. If I should clear out the order ID, when I should clear out the order ID, I should clear out the order ID from the session variable when the order is successfully paid for. If tag the ID with a date time and use the most recent. The order ID is generated by the database though. And it's not, I do, if this order is still hanging around and somebody might for some reason get back to that. Let me just think for a second. Damn. Yeah, they have the same object API. but I have to grab the correct entity out of the corresponding table. Yeah. Uh, the reason for that is because then I don't know how to just, I don't know if it's an order or a subscription. If I just said entity ID in the session variable, I'm not sure which table to query. So somehow I had to distinguish that, unless there's just a generic way for Django to query across tables if these uh, IDs are unique across tables, but I don't think they are. I think they're just sequential integers. So that's not, yes, but then it'll throw a 404 uh, the way I've implemented it. If I, if it doesn't, so if I query both, one of them's always gonna throw a 404, if not both or not always, but usually. So then, 
user couldn't check out. And even then though, I have to know which one, even if I queried them both successfully, if I switched this method, then I have two entities. I have an order and an object, and I'm still back to right where I started. I don't know which one I'm paying for. So I have to know which one I'm paying for. The whole thing here is to get to this Braintree payment transaction. So in other words, to make a sale of one of these entities is an order or a subscription. So I think if I can just pass in some metadata here, it's one approach that I don't have to worry about whether or not these session variables are lingering somehow. You could pass it as a URL fragment. Yeah, like in the query string or something. Yeah, let's see how that would work. A post param. Okay, uh, I believe this is a get request though. This redirect, I think is making a get request. Let's go to the official docs. Redirect to args permanent false quargs returns an HTTP response redirect to the appropriate URL for the arguments passed. The arguments could be a model, a view name, possibly with arguments. Ah, so actually, if I define that as an argument for the view, and then do it here. wrong level there okay hey quantum thanks for stopping in enjoy your dinner it's really interesting to learn about your your work reading the doc is always a good idea yeah thank you <laughs> i did glimpse it but yeah you're right fair enough <laughs> yeah and help help the uh, odu project to update their docs and onboarding process <laughs> Maybe catch you later tonight. Okay, see you around. Oops. So what was that? You just give it a name. Our quarks. Correctly, quarks. I don't know if this is unnecessary indentation, but oh well, here we go. Now, we have an extra level of indentation. Uh, previous page. Boom. Okay, so it's gonna reverse, give us the reverse URL for the Thing, and hopefully we will have a re, uh, view it's the previous page so subscription print only two years subscriber anyway it doesn't matter subscribe oh 
All right, well, that's fine. Mm, yeah, okay. I see what I'm doing wrong here. So it's actually going to try to put it into the URL. Which is okay. Except... No, I did find this, this, this uh, URL here. Need a URL argument, so without the regex syntax, it's just. Let's see here. Square break, ankle braces, brackets. So it could. Another thing that Wagtail kind of makes it so you don't have to write this type of code, and this I just will revert the changes. Now I have the previous page here. So yeah, it kind of obscures your learning by saving you time. So it's a little bit of a trade-off. I'll refresh this. Subscription type, print only, two years, subscriber. And we got payment process, subscribe. Good, good, good. Now in the, so our view's over here. And right here, actually. Previous page. Subscribe right here. Yeah. So if previous page equals subscribe, this should only ever be one. Let's move 
case where they're more relevant. And else. This is a payment error. Something not very user friendly and rendering just the static HTML. It's not the super best. I'd rather actually just show a 404 or some sort of meaningful error. If raising is appropriate in, in this, why not? Can I process payment for unknown item? Well, that's pretty abstract. Let's see if it works. Okay, so what do we have here? Squiggles. $134.72 for two years plus 10 year discount. That sounds good. One year is just normal price. 72. All right, good. All right, fix that. I'm not sure if this raising is the appropriate way to do it. Plus, I didn't import it. I'm going to just check for the in, the existence of this argument. Hmm. I think it already threw an error. Let's just leave this out. All right. Also, previous page equals bookstore order. So, an order screen. Uh, here we are doing it in the view. Which should be the same as this. Gratuitous indentation. Book 
bookstore order. I believe that was what the logic is checking for. Yep. All right. So we add previous page. Commit that. That we're always fetching the correct entity. When we render the price, it's not coming from some other um, environment uh, session variable. I think otherwise, clearing the session variables on success is still appropriate. And then add link to subscribe. Whoa, Quantum, that was fast. Did you did you order in, or did you cook something quick in the microwave? Pizza. Did you even warm it up? <laughs> okay, cool. Let's see. I need to take a quick break and I got that bug sorted out. Um, committed the code. I'm going to uh, I'll be back in about five minutes. Uh, I don't have an interlude uh, musical thing. I'll set that up uh, in a minute so that there's some AFK-ness going on when I'm AFK or something that interesting going on away from keyboard. But, uh, uh, ooh, got it for takeout. Very cool. What kind, of, uh, what kind of pizza? What restaurant was it? All right, see you in a minute. I'm going to mute the mic and I'll be back ASAP. Okay, I'm back. Local pizzeria, just traditional Italian pizzas. Sounds good, can't go wrong with that, yeah. Nice, so it's like a thin crust. Uh, what kind of toppings did you get on there? Okay, so next we will continue our journey with the original plan. Hmm, I'm thinking there might be like some sort of middleware or something here, essentially when I render a magazine article, hmm, 
Yes, a magazine article. So let's, I want to check that this, if the user has an uh, active subscription. So first, close, close, close. Let's subscribe. I can't remember if it's 1444 or 41101. No, there's 41101. Uh, I just realized though. Ham artichokes, mushroom, and, and an egg, dude. That's traditional. <laughs> Quite interesting combination. I don't think I've ever had egg on pizza. <laughs> I've had it on cheeseburgers. Let's see. Okay, I gotta check something. Subscriber email. All right. So here's the problem. First, I need to check my user information. Because I don't have an email. So let's put that there. Um, I, okay. There's my initials. Stanky. Okay. Now. Pizza Capricosa. Let's check this out. I'm about to have a revelation. Expanding my horizons. Mozzarella cheese, Italian baked ham, mushroom, artichoke, and tomato. Okay, that sounds traditional. I thought you were going to show me that it's like already has eggs on it. It's the common. Ooh, this is interesting. Some seasonings on there. Pizza capricosa. <laughs> so the egg is just an, an extra touch. Oh, no, it's there. <laughs> cool. Oh, good to know. Here in Finland, uh, there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of pizza places. Really popular food, and I think they try to do this Italian style, but it's just always just soggy, and limp, and then they put rucola on top, and then they put salad dressings on top. <laughs> Across the top, it's so. Yeah, Finland has weird pizza. Don't they have banana pizza? Hmm. I've never, <laughs> I've never seen a banana pizza here. All right. So now we know my stanky initials. The key thing here is that I've got an email. Now when I subscribe, I will use that email. Just a simple one. Success. Hey, what's up, Laser six nine six nine six nine? Hello, living legend. Oh boy, who are you talking to? Quantum. <laughs> All right. I am out of tea. Oh no, I'm not out of tea. I've got a club mate. Should I drink a club mate at nine thirty at night? Am I asking for trouble? Am I a web developer? I am indeed doodly a web developer. I'm doing Python recently, but I do uh, sometimes also enjoy uh, JavaScript and HTML and CSS, so the core framework web platform languages. What are you building, Laser? You have a project in mind? Are you, are you needing some help on uh, working on a particular problem? What are we building today? 
We are building a magazine website for a nonprofit organization. It's actually quite an elaborate website I've been working on for over a year. <laughs> I think I, I think I actually committed the first. Where is it? November, October 2018. So yeah, I've been <laughs> working on it for a while. Oh, cool, thanks. This is actually uh, the old website, powered by Drupal, that I've been working on for six years. Um, so I mentioned this earlier, Drupal lets you do a lot of stuff through sort of point, point and click, but not quite so much as Odoo, actually. Talk to Quantum about Odoo, it's really cool. Uh, content management system. And uh, the thing is, um, Drupal's written in PHP, and we are increasingly in needing to kind of peek under the covers to see how things work and modify it. So uh, the decision was made a year ago to port it over to Python and Django. So currently we're working on this magazine subscription feature, and it has payments, financial transactions, and it has um, logic to see if you've got an active subscription so that you can view the latest article uh, latest issues articles from the latest issues cool um, I currently working in a company or running my own company slash business I have a day job and this is uh, uh, it's semi paid work non profit I, I get a uh, I guess we call it a retainer a small monthly amount to keep this project alive Odoo is mostly an ERP though but if we get the website builder good enough, I can see it becoming a good CMS as well. Yeah, I think, man, see if you can convince the the higher ups, the powers that be to actually branch the website builder off its own thing. That would be super cool. Because everybody needs a website builder. All right, cool. I think so. I mean, if you look at the market size for WordPress, and it's huge. And he won't agree to it. Okay, so it's one iron-fisted person who has the, the the last word. All right. So let's come back here. Oh, and by the way, Laser, if you're interested in web development, check out the Codebytes community. Totally nonprofit, open source uh, platform and community. They've got a ton of groups. Here, uh, here's a JavaScript group, 30 days of vanilla JavaScript coding challenge. Uh, if you're doing boot camp or getting ready to, for a job interview, I would get lots and lots and lots of groups. I'm in the Python groups mainly, because that's my interest. But there's something for everybody here. I'll send you the link here. Yes, the community link, meaning, yes, the Code Buddies link, yes. There we go. All right, and Quantum says, uh, let me see. Oh, so, sorry, Laser says the learning web development to get rich as soon as possible. Don't hate me for that, I love web development too. All right, well, good luck, and uh, it would be cool to see your endeavors, what you're building, what kind of product ideas you have, and how you uh, market those and build a community around those. Um, let's see, Quantum says, it's not really an iron fist, but he's got his own ideas. And in the end, he's the, co he's the founder and CEO, so he has the last word, even when it's misguided. That makes sense. Okay, so what am I doing? Got to check out this payment form. Now I've got my subscription, and I go to the magazine article. So I have to set up some dummy content. If I Right now, if I click the magazine, you're going to see some warnings. Because... I don't have that section of the website set up. Let's go ahead and scaffold that out, just content-wise. The welcome uh, page should have a child page for magazine.
Yeah, and Laser, I, um, all my Hangouts are hosted here. The cool thing about um, Code Buddies is all the groups, but um, these Hangouts are facilitated by the group leaders and, and people in the community. So if you're wanting to learn React, for example, to make your um, JavaScript web app fly, you can learn that here. Uh, I've been doing a little bit of experiments in the evenings with music just with JavaScript, HTML, and a little bit of SVG. It's a pretty interesting project we're building there. Cool. Actually, my brother joined me last, last session, and we haven't hung out in over 13 years. We've barely talked in that period, but all of a sudden now we're just hanging out online. So, we're... Okay, let's get back on it. Add a child page to the magazine. We are going to add a magazine issue. Uh, the issue will be, let's get a, a good one, on separation. Speaking of separation, my brother and I hadn't seen each other in 13 years. But my, he might visit Finland. I've been over in Finland for six years. Save that image. No, my home folder. What the heck? Let's see, Laser says, I also created a web app using React and Node recently. React is cool. November 2019. So for this, I just have to hard code it to the front. The first day of the month, I'll upload a picture here. Here's, by the way, our musical. Oh, you can't see it. Darn it. Never mind. Excuse me. <clears throat> Oh no, I got hiccups. I haven't even opened my Club Mate. What's going on? All right, so we've got the issue of the magazine. Now an issue, when you open it, it has articles in there. And we need an article. One that is subject to the preview. Listening Beyond Words. Child page. Oh. <laughs> ah, okay. So here is the main. I have to add a new field. And uh, by the way, you can host your node project for free on Netlify. And get continuous de uh, deployment from GitHub is really cool. That's good advice. Thanks, Quantum. Uh, Heroku. Yeah, I've been hosting uh, the development version of this website on Heroku also. But yeah, I'm already hitting the limits of the free tier. And what I'm kind of, I just don't like or annoys me about Heroku is they don't have like their pricing, it just jumps from the free tier to like 50 bucks a month almost. I think there's someone in between there, but it's like not uh, substantially different from the free tier. In other words, you don't get more CPU or something. So yeah, I'm looking for Django hosting. We've been in discernment about that. I've been checking out Doku. Doku. Have you guys, have you all seen this Doku? Small platform as a service implementation it's pretty rad it uses the um, Heroku what do they call those dev packs or something in any case yeah you can host these uh, node applications and stuff with this as well I just didn't really want to manage a server so that's what I was kind of looking for actually a platform as a service that would just do me good by my Django projects, but haven't found one. Uh, except there's Python Anywhere, which I'm pretty much leaning towards because they have good, I think it's a fair price. Uh, let's see, you know, for, well, they do this big jump also from 12 bucks to 100 bucks. What? I mean, come on. 
But they have this scalable thing. You can, uh, da, da, sorry, scrolling really fast. Five to 500 a month, so. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Quantum, for the Doku, you need your own server. If I could find a company that just gave managed Doku hosting, the I mean, I really like the Heroku experience. You know, like single command deployments, you can check the logs, you can run commands on the server. It's pretty smooth, but their pricing, it just jumps. And then the whole dyno thing is a little bit confusing as well. So you got free, hobby, which is basically free, and then you jump 25, okay. Um, so the seven bucks a month never sleeps. Per dyno per month. Well, oh, okay, 512 megs of RAM. That's what I was worried about. Uh, I don't know if Django would need a gig of RAM, but I mean, DigitalOcean, you get that much cheap. Maybe I'm just spoiled by DigitalOcean pricing and quality. I mean, it's also really simple, but I just don't want to. So you start at five bucks a month with one gig of RAM and 25 gigs of space. And Hir Heroku is kind of opaque about those metrics, but if I uh, so if I want a gig of RAM, then I have to get. professional package so that means I'm over here so 25 minimum uh, quantum says managing a server isn't all that hard and you can get VPS for very cheap these days I think you can get a single virtual core and 2 gig RAM for uh, with unlimited traffic for like 3 euros on OVH you have checked out OVH as well uh, again I'm really spoiled on DigitalOcean I think that they're a really good offer and they have data centers in the EU as well, but OVH is good. Okay, let's get back on track. So I've got one article. Yes, now uh, 3D dollars. Quantum, are you talking to yourself? You said $3. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you said that, and then you said, wow. <laughs> nice. No, all right. I was expecting the U.S. pricing to be higher. Mm. Oh, all right, sorry. <laughs> the dollar sign in the euro, all right. Good grief. For some reason, I just don't really... <laughs> didn't click. I don't distinguish those, and I find myself doing that. When I buy something at a store, I'm like, oh, it costs three bucks. I think it's just three currency units. It doesn't really matter in my brain for some reason. All right, so what we need to add to the magazine, this I ran by Mary and she agreed, this a little bit kludgy, but we have the uh, magazine, where's my symbol browser? Magazine article. How do I collapse all? Can you collapse everything? Magazine article. Here we go. So the magazine article has a body text. And we're just going to add a new field for teaser, which is above the body. And this is what people see when they're not subscribers. It's a rich text field. Python manage pi make migrations. Yeah, the uh, EU exchange rate uh, with... Uh, Euro exchange rate and dollar, yeah, they're almost, it's like 1.1 or something like that. So we'll migrate that field in. I'll commit those migrations because, uh-oh, uh-oh. I've got some migrations I didn't. Oh, 
added help text. So yeah, when I add help text, I have to migrate those changes. Huh. Oh, this is this. Same thing, basically. All right, now we'll save our model and run the migrations and migrate them actually. So generate the migrations, then then migrate. Add article teaser. Teaser. Are you running your own uh, VPS quantum? Are you running anything? We've got a mind test server. Have you ever played mind test? It's fun. It's really good. An open source voxel game engine. Play one of the mini games. Mod a game to your liking. Make your own game. Or play on a multiplayer server. So my son and I have set up a multiplayer server. Our own mind test world. It's pretty fun. And so I'm running it on a... Oh, it's like... Well, it's $10 a month. Because I gave it extra RAM. Because it's a video game server. And these are procedurally generated worlds and they grow and there's um, mobs like animals and stuff that roam around and take up RAM. Quantum says, I wanted to get one on Black Friday since it was an even cheaper 35 a year. Whoa, if I didn't have a, a credit card. I still don't have a credit card. Oh, okay, and they don't take some sort of online payment or direct debit or whatever. Whoa, wrong, wrong button. <clears throat> All right, so we've migrated that in. Now if I go ahead and I'm here in the on separation issue and I look at this, listening beyond words um, article, we want, so if I look at it real quick since I already made the mistake. Well, it's not really a mistake, but it's an omission. That I'm about to fix. So we have a title and a body field. And when I tell Wagtail to render the content panels, it also needs, it'll generate this form for us. But I have to tell it which fields and some other metadata. So now if I refresh the page, we have a teaser. The main purpose of this teaser field is that's what the non-subscriber sees. Quantum says, yeah, that's the one thing I hate about OBH. Hmm, yeah, not having a payment. Do you have like a, uh, let's see. Yeah, what's a good example of one that you can pay for with a with PayPal balance or something? Hmm, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Cool, so now we've got this article. And let's edit the template. Rendered. Top over here, magazine, close my outline. Templates, if I go to the article. And here we go. Just gonna put the teaser in there. view that page live. So now we have the article teaser and the main article body, some other metadata and navigation links. The next step is going to be to add logic that'll check for the active subscription and renders one of these and a subscribe button for non-subscribers. Uh, Quantum says, I should really just get a credit card by now. I've just put, been putting it off. Yeah, so why don't you have a bank card? That's surprising. Do you have a bank account? Because, I mean, that's, you just get a bank card. Visa Electron, what they call it here in Finland. I think it's just a general thing, a Visa Electron. Ah. Yeah, it's a common thing. Uh, yeah, so this is actually my bank, also spunky. Visa Electron is a debit card product that uses a Visa payment system. It is offered by issuing banks in every country with the exception of Canada, Australia, Ireland, and the United States. 
get this one. It's good. But they don't take my... Oh, I don't have debit, but they don't take my specific type of debit card. It doesn't have that verification code. Oh, the CB code in there. What kind of bank is... Hey, what's up, level two? Welcome. We are talking about payments and paying for stuff online while I'm building a online payment form. Hmm. Quantum, sounds like you need a new bank. Because that's pretty standard issue to have a CV code. Discord, Quantum, uh, level two, I mean, I set up a Discord. I did do it. Um, I don't have my bot, my stream bot, set up with that, that command. How do I do that? Do you, how do I share you the link? Do you just want the link to the Discord or do I give you an invite? Do you all want an invite to my Discord? All right. Oh, you did? You submitted a change? I didn't see that. You got a pull request open? I did not get a notification. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong, <laughs> I'm on the wrong repository. You sent it to this one. Yeah, I don't have a pull request here. Can you open up a pull request against this repository? Level two. I'm not really working on this one on the stream today, but uh, we can continue that another day um, so Mike and I are gonna be hanging out this Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern European time where we'll be working on this music um, JavaScript and SVG app we've got some cool ideas kicking around and Mike's already gone off and done some research on it so stay tuned but today I'm working on this Python Django Wagtail CMS magazine subscription website with online payment processing and all sorts of good stuff. Uh, is this deployed somewhere? Yes, it is. If you'd like to check it out, Western friend dot Western dash friend dot Heroku app. As mentioned earlier, I can add a discord. I, uh, I can add a a Twitch uh, command for that as well. But in any case, let me follow through on this. I'll give you a quick link to my Discord channel. And this was set up at the urging of level two, who's been hanging out and we've been collaborating on some projects. So level two said, Having a Discord channel will make it basically easier for us to have a history of the chats and, and work closely together and stuff. Um, so I just created one. I don't know really specifically much more about it or how we'll use it uh, or even what to name it. So I just, so sorry if it's... <laughs> I'm not trying to be egotistical here. I just used my name. I don't know what else. So, But if we, if we want to take it in a different direction, then that is cool too. So Quantum is, oh, the music app, is it deployed? You know, it, it should be, because, uh, but it isn't. Um, so level two thought they deployed it. Let me just, um, set that up. Hey, I got a Bing. Level two just arrived. Seems op, please nerf. Okay. I think I understand that language. They seem OP. Please reduce their efficacy. They seem elite. Bot Clyde. Hello, boop boop. Hmm. Excellent. All right, so uh, back to the question. Is this deployed? No, but I should probably just set up a GitHub page to deploy it because essentially it's just an HTML, a static HTML file, right? In the master directory. Can I just do that? Don't peek. 
All right, so, oh, I'm sorry, here it is. Um, yeah, so actually that was a, it's pretty straightforward to deploy. That is the beauty of just using HTML. So, I'm not sure if those notes are playing. You can hear them through my microphone though. And we didn't actually end up, um, making a tonnets diagram which tonnets is a little bit different if you are interested in music theory and, and alternative uh, musical instruments and interfaces for musical improvisation um, check out some youtube videos on music that's been uh, rendered using a tonnets diagram it's really cool how it, it organizes the musical notes in a system like where the note families are all clustered together. Uh, but we ended up going with the, what's called the circle of fifths or the circle of keys or the circle of fourths, depending on which direction you're spinning. And just figured out how to get the underlying code work working to play chords in this key of C. And these labels, they get a little bit in the way. So here's a two. Five, one. Yeah, oh, in Firefox, I'm running in. Huh, I haven't actually tested it in Firefox. Dang it. Why is that? Works for me in Firefox. Uh, the, okay, I'm um, sorry. It's, this is really um, beta, if not alpha software right now. So the thing is only D, A, E, G, C, and F buttons work right now and you can't click on the letter <laughs> sorry <laughs> to be continued but essentially all we managed last time is to change this shape uh, and now start adding a few chords there's quite a lot of learning going on so you have to just click right there on the oh nikes right there on the edge Really? Level two? That's brilliant. Pointer event equals none on the letter. We'll fix that. Okay, can you open a pull request? I'm going to get back on uh, track here a little bit in today's session because it's already 10 o'clock and I, I still haven't cracked my club mate in, in any case. But if you open a pull request here, I'll be glad. By the way, um, level two, this is currently licensed as MIT, but I was wondering if we should relicense it as... Uh, like a GPL or a GPL. Don't know why specifically. I think I was looking at uh, incorporating a tool that was GPL. So would you mind if uh, if your uh, your contribution was also licensed as a, a strong copy left? All right, cool. Quantum. That sounds great. Yeah, this is awesome and uh, awesome to have people that, that are involved in contributing to it and helping steer the process. And basically, we're, I think the kind of goal for this project at least is not only to learn how to use um, web standard stuff to make music without any build tools or anything advanced, but to make it uh, an interface that's um, to some degree more intuitive than say the neck of a guitar or a saxophone or um, piano forte might be in terms of the music theory the relationships of notes and chords most of those instruments are either you know like one dimensional all the or on a piano they're one dimensional you kind of play from left to right to go low to high saxophone i'm not sure how the fingering system works but it's the interfaces are essentially 
um, constrained to the mechanics of the instrument with the guitar and saxophone and trumpet and wind instruments, you know, like, uh, whereas this is constrained to the music theory and it, you don't have to know the theory to be able to play it and you play interesting sounding things just by, and a kid can pick this up and play it. So it should be intuitive for like a child and adult alike. We're all, we're all but children. Does it use a web audio API? Yeah, we're using a, this thing called Tone.js, which is using web audio API underneath. I'm trying to get levels up uh, in abstraction a little bit. So, uh, but it is, let me see. Yeah, it is using the web audio API. Indeed, it is. And like, as you notice, uh, it's just an HTML file with an embedded SVG and some JavaScript events. So you don't need, there's nothing fancy to it. You can just drop it into a, a web server or a GitHub um, page. You don't need a, a, even Netlify. It's so simple. Yeah, that's the SVG decision, and it can be, we can change it. If you think about what's the alternative to building the interface, what would you say would be the alternative uh, approach to building the the Tonit interface or the Circle of Fifths interface? What would be another approach that you could? Uh, Well, whatever you want, it's a little bit broad, but HTML is uh, zeroing in on it, but HTML is not a graphical language necessarily. It's a structure language. And you use CSS to style things. So pure HTML, we can use images. Well, SVG is basically an image. Yeah, they're both just XML, but the way that SVG rendered it, renders is quite different than HTML. <laughs> All right, hey, but let's take this one up on Sunday. This is an interesting conversation, and uh, we can certainly go through uh, the design process. But essentially, the reason I went with SVG is because you can use Inkscape to design any arbitrary user interface and then just hook it into some JavaScript events. And by the way, this is a little bit further off topic, but uh, my brother and I have been using this open source uh, tool called VCV Rack. Uh, it's like this modular music production environment. It's pretty much fully open source. There are some commercial plugins, but there's a ton and ton and ton of open source plugins. And these uh, plugin elements, the UI elements are made with SVG so that designers can get in there and make really clever user interfaces and then coders can wire them up. Um, but if these interfaces had been designed in code, then, well, then designers would have been left at, out of it. And I don't think we would have nearly the range of just craziness that uh, some of the designers have brought uh, to, this, to this process. And yeah, so that's also one reason I'm a little bit of a React detractor because it's uh, I think there's really good power in having separation of um, sort of like the the structural HTML from the job, imperative JavaScript because designers are already comfortable working with uh, declarative languages like HTML and CSS and their tools are actually writing those for them underneath their drag and drop tools. So React having combined all those into one uh, context I think has alienated a lot of people who would otherwise be able to jump into web development and make some remarkable stuff. Cool. So that's just another tangent there. Yes. That data attributes was a level two suggestion. I think that was a really brilliant suggestion. It helped to help the project move forward. Pretty clever. All right, so I've got to figure out in Django when I'm rendering this magazine article how to insert something into the context. Oh, let's see. That's straightforward. And this is actually a wagtail thing. So I go back to the magazine article. 
and it's a class and it has this method So first I want to get the current user. Request our user, All right? So then in Wagtail you can override the there's a git context method, but I don't know if um, this git page context will pass in the request or if I need to do it at a different level. So in the page model, you can override the template context, and it does pass in the request. All right, perfect. So, oh, here's an example of it, and there's a request right there. It's a magazine article. So I can I can take this method signature and come down to magazine article. Oh, I don't know where, but. Here's probably good. All right, so inside this context, I'll get the current user ID. I don't know if this is actually necessary to store that as a variable, but um, current user equals, come back over here. Well, there, oh, actually it's right there. whole user object is right there. So if I can get the email from that when viewing an article, mm -hmm. and so it's a string representation. Let's check my email. There it is. All right, so I need to do this super stuff. Yeah, so that the page will render correctly. Mm -hmm. And just return that to the level two says quantum. Which one do you think would be a good one to do? The tonics graphic or the circle one? I'll bring them up on the screen. I'll send you guys the, all the links because I think either would be great if you take the project in whichever direction. And you know, we might be able to do them both. And have like a page, sort of a page interface. Oh, Dr. Unafraid sent me a message. Okay, I guess they didn't send me one. Where is it? Comments of Wikimedia.org. And there's a bunch of circles of circles of fifths. If you want to check out some more inspiration there. And because we do whichever one in HTML or SVG. Yeah, some combination of those. So it just deploys straight away. And if you find other geometrical representations of music or other just ideas, ever clever, clever ideas, you know, I'm open to suggestions. All right, so we got the context, the page context now should render correctly, should it? If I save, if I save it well and refresh after the Servers related. Okay, cool. And we have my email in there. Good. SVG is probably just fine. Level two says, I feel best to focus on one as a main interface. Yeah, I agree. Level two, and particularly so that we can just move forward if we if we just, uh, that way we won't spread ourselves too thin. Now, the circle of fifths is much more commonly known than the Tonitz diagram. Uh, so, and it's really useful too. Um, when you have a key center, you know, the, the neighboring chords are gonna sound harmonious 
or consonant. If you move a little bit further away, you're going to darken it or brighten it up, depending if you're moving counterclockwise or clockwise. And there's actually some really cool modulations you can do around that circle, uh, sort of like taking a train ride or tunneling through the earth or taking a plane ride. You can go near and far um, and land in really cool and exotic places. And you hear jazz musicians do this all the time. Um, in the circle of fifths, in the tonus diagram actually, the circle of fifths moreover it makes it more apparent what's going on. You can see the modulation, then you can see how they're staying in one area, they're going around town, trying out a couple of coffee shops, having dinner, and then going on to another destination. It's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, the tonus is cool. I don't know as much application for it. It was mainly I just wanted to hear it and touch it. Oh, and by the way, that would be one thing we can work out next session is how to get this running on a tablet. Uh, so I can probably set up an Android simulator or something like that, but no, it would be a tablet because I'm hoping multi-touch would work. And one longer term goal is to actually produce some MIDI output and use it as a MIDI controller to play notes through a synthesizer. And I did look a little bit uh, about generating MIDI notes with, um, with JavaScript uh, and found a library for that called jazz.js. I think it's what it's called, jazz. I think this is it. And this will probably work. And the code for jazz is not too much different than the code we've already got working in uh, the current Tonnets project, which we can rename or whatever. But uh, I think it'd be a matter of adding a couple of lines of code and including the library. And um, yeah, so it's good stuff. What and there's this NJW project also. Uh, oh, what is it called? This Node WebKit NWJS project. If we start finding ourselves heavy in, uh, uh, well, I'd like to avoid a build tool. I'd like to avoid NPM if possible. Just keep this really, really, really simple. But if we do find ourselves getting into a node land, uh, this NWJS makes it so you can run Node.js modules directly from DOM and enables new way of writing applications with all web technologies. So I wouldn't mind getting a little bit into deeper water uh, as long as this thing at the end of the day it renders just in a plain HTML page and hopefully on a tablet like Android and iOS should be cross-platform and send MIDI signals. I guess if it's just running on GitHub pages I can just load it in a browser and Android or iOS, and hopefully it can hook up to like Bluetooth or USB and send MIDI signals. Wish you could just dump this in the Discord. I'll copy and paste in Discord. Oh, good point. So that way we have the links. I didn't think about that. Okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna get this done. I will have this working in a minute. Ooh, I got Discord link. Okay, cool. So going back taking a sip of tea for good luck so we've got this request user email let's see if there's a subscription for that and I might factor this out to a method or something but um, uh, or user subscription or something Email equals. 
Let's shorten it up a little bit. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah. At least it's a meaningful variable name. It's a little bit long though. see I wonder if truthiness would come would work here yeah equals true let's just try that so then we can refresh this page and I shouldn't have made any changes just see if there's some off keyword email into fields so I think it's subscriber email so at this point okay so didn't throw any errors of active subscriber text of the page body else show the teaser and I'll do a call to action in a minute My Emmett shortcuts aren't working because I'm in Django land now for full access and I don't want to shout at people am I rem remembering these wrong in for oh yeah I'm using the wrong I'm using some sort of other templating language here <clears throat> let's, let's use the correct using like handlebars or something of being a semi-proficient polyglot programmer semi is probably overestimating but in any case main article body because I'm a subscriber now if I'm not a subscriber let's see let's just make this let's just flip it refresh it okay so that is not working oh I didn't save it that's why let's see quantum all right I'm gonna get me some sleep but it was nice to hang out hopefully we'll catch you on the Sunday then all right thanks quantum thanks for stopping in hope you didn't already leave hope we have to say goodbye before you left all right subscribe now for full access article teaser okay so it is working Good, 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 good. So that worked. Why is that red squiggle there? Oh. Well, that's not true. I think this is actually a pretty good uh, stopping point. I've been over two hours uh, into this session, and I believe um, 
achieved more or less what I was hoping for and some other uh, kind of bugs that I ironed out at the beginning. So if I log out, what happens? Level 2 says, hope seeing people come to the stream would make you want to stream more. It, yeah, it does, certainly does. I'm glad to have um, people hanging out. It's also, just tonight it's almost 10.30 and I'm kind of tired. I've actually had a pretty long day. But yeah, let me fix this bug. Okay, so essentially I can't assume that this user will have an email. Can I assume that request a user will be there? What's the best way of handling this? So if request user. Let's try that. Because I think we're going to make, uh, I think every user needs an email. Or we're going to do something like and request user email. Can you just do that? Or is this a JavaScript? Am I getting too JavaScripty here? The presence of these would be truthy, right? Anonymous user object has no attribute email. Uh, yes, same problem. Hmm, so it didn't shortcut it, short circuit it. That's maybe why I'm being too JavaScripty. Uh, wait. Save that. It shouldn't be. Checking for them, the email. Oh, uh, I get it, I get it. So the anonymous user is, is there, but uh, yeah, of course. nested ifs level two says now you have discord i suggest you add a panel to your twitch page of your discord and you can add a section to discord if you don't know like a tonics chat room just for tonics and so it doesn't have to be in general or you can make uh, me a mod in discord and i'll do it for you i don't know if a mod have that power though okay um I'll make you a mod. Uh, I don't know how to do that. I gotta stay focused. Oh. There's something happened. <laughs> Mentions member list. Okay, so there's the member list. Uh, Right-clicking your name, profile, mention call, add note, mute, change the name, invite to server, activity feed, add friend, block, server mute, server deafen. Hmm. Server settings. Moderation. Uh, no, user management, members. Uh, to learn for life. Add role mod. Moderator. Hmm. Not sure. Hey, I I can hear you. Are you chatting? <laughs> okay, I gotta focus though. I I can't do uh. Too many things at once. 
Nice. That's, Discord is pretty cool, though. Thanks for suggesting. I really appreciate it. And uh, all these enhancements for the stream, I, I do I take those seriously, so I'll get those set up and this uh, stream elements and such. So, yeah, basically in here, I have to check for user email also. If it's a little bit redundant, I wonder if actually just the first would work. If I just check that property existence, if it will throw, throw an error. Uh, you can do, let's see, attribute or property. Mm. If has attribute, yeah. has attribute a property default value email is not defined has to be a string no problem no problem there we go all right got it uh, love two says just want to say nwjs is cool and it'd be kind of cool to build something that I played in it But not a full-blown application So if we do go that route uh, for a desktop app, that'd be cool. All right. Sounds good. Uh, by the way level two Have you what are your thoughts on how we can make it? Um, kind of tablet friendly do you think just having it run in the browser on a tablet would be enough and keeping in mind that the reason for it to be on a tablet is so that it could be a virtual instrument that you could take around and connect to send MIDI signals to a host controller, a MIDI host, where it is hosting a synthesizer or something like that. That's going to be where this thing gets crazy. If we can de if we can design arbitrary SVG interfaces for MIDI controllers, this this will be cool. So we've got the subscription, we've got the active subscription and uh, the text warning us, uh, you know, subscribe now for full access. I guess I'll do one last thing and make that a button or an actually an anchor. And this is where I've got to stop hard coding these. The problem being the subscribe page is actually a um, sort of a content item. This is added at runtime. When you run the server, you you create the content. This is not a hard coded thing, so I don't have a quick way of getting the route for it aside from convention of using slash subscribe. I'll figure out a lot better approach to this, but for now, I'm sort of cludging this together. Um, and I'm not trying to cut too many corners because uh, I don't like doing that. And I try to <laughs> not kind of make things harder for myself later. But in this case, it's like a necessary thing until I figure out a better way. Uh, I think I have an idea, actually. It would be a settings, something on the, on the site settings that allows you, so when you're logged in, my super secret testing password. And I go to the admin. You actually define settings for the um, platform. So I could have a uh, setting here, similar to the menu configuration, where it would like essentially give you a widget to select a page that should be for. So you'd say select, um, or are we doing subscription page, and you just would select it here, and then boom, it saves it into the setting. I can define a custom setting. So I have actually figured out that um, approach. I just have not gone to the extent of doing it. <clears throat> so let's view this live again and check out my template. 
Level 2 says, we'll have to study up on that and make it uh, as a web thing. Only will it work... Oh, yeah, so it'll be portable for tablet and in WJS desktop app, too. Yeah. And if you're into that kind of thing, I'll, I'll send another link um, when I remember it. Now I've already forgotten it. Let's see if I can get it. Nah, they're, they're, if you like the 3D modeling, there's this really cool um, WebGL um, toolkit that's built with NWJS. Uh, I wish I could remember the name of it. In any case, let's put this button here. As you can tell, I'm getting tired and need to wrap this up. Okay, so now that I'm, I'm logged in as a subscriber, it's showing me the main body. So if I log back out and that's working, let's do button outline. Oh, whoa, whoa, Robin. there we go. I'm going to view my stars real quick. Uh, not my stars personally, but the things I've starred. Well, I'm trying not to dox myself here, but in any case, Dang, there's this cool project. 3DJS, are you doing this for a job or playing around? Uh, so this project, this Western Friend project is, um, you could loosely call it a job. It's not really a job. Uh, it's something I've been doing for six years though for this nonprofit and I do get like a monthly, um, almost like a stipend or a retainer to continue doing the development work. And it is also a good way to refine my programming skills, learn new things. So it pays in that sense. Uh, my day job, I do um, data work, uh, and um, this music thing is just playing around. I enjoy music, and I think I want to spend more time on that, uh, developing that gift, and helping other people also enjoy their musical gifts through int intuitive musical, digital musical instruments. Cool. And Mary might want to change this button text. So that's something I'll have to think about, but I'll wait for her to say that she'd like to do that. All right, so let's go ahead and commit these changes. And I really think I'll have to, ref uh, have to factor this out because I'll, we'll want to use this, this subscription check in a couple of other places, but I'm not sure where that code should live. I'll have to th think about how Django organizes it. It might be like a, hmm, probably a custom template tag that I can reuse in multiple templates. Sounds about right. Cool beans. So I think that's about it. We've got some pretty good progress today. Fixed a couple of bugs, fixed a bug in the unified uh, payment screen. Uh, I'll have to do a recap in a moment. I'll put that on the YouTube stream where we'll, we'll take a quick glance at all the code changes that were made during this session. Quick summary. Uh, but it's been really good hanging out. Level two, I'm glad you stopped in again. It's always nice chatting, and I hope uh, to see you this Sunday, 3 p.m. Eastern European time. I and mean, if we want, we can uh, meet up in um, 
the Discord a little bit earlier and prepare some ideas for that live coding session. Uh, I know Quantum's already gone, but uh, yep, I appreciate how active Quantum was during the chat as well. It's always nice, again, to have you know just these off-topic conversations and all that good stuff. And even I've been getting some great advice on programming style and, and libraries and stuff like that. Laser696969, thanks for stopping in also and participating in the chat for a little bit. Hope to see you around and thanks for the subscribe. All right, level two, well, I'm out for the night. And, um, you know, thanks for stopping in. If uh, anyone who's watching this on YouTube, do feel free to add any questions or comments below the video. I try to respond to those pretty quickly. And this has been another Code Buddies Jam. I really recommend people join this Code Buddies community. It's got such a great spirit and there's so many uh, cool people and they're scheduling hangouts, a lot to learn. We're all teaching one another. So really good ethos, very active community, codebuddies.org. Well, thanks again for watching and have a great day.